Hi, and welcome to everyone that just uh, is tuning in for this Earth Optimism Deep Dive. Thank you. Uh, I'm Aviva Rosenthal, Director of the Smithsonian's Office of International Relations. We focus on our long-term relationships and partnerships with foreign governments and multilateral organizations. So it's a real pleasure to have the commissioner join us for this important discussion. The Smithsonian's international work is deep and vast as we work in over 140 countries on diverse topics such as climate change, biodiversity conservation, global health, and cultural uh, heritage protection and sustainability. The European Union has been a valued partner of the Smithsonian Institution, and our scientists, curators, educators, and scholars are collaborating with European partners in areas ranging from anthropology to zoology, or from A to Z, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. Through Earth Optimism, the Smithsonian aims to inspire people to take positive action towards environmental conservation by focusing on the opportunities that society can draw from a sustainable world. The EU's ambitious plans seem to be a perfect example of Earth optimism in action. And the EU will play a key role in the world's struggle to combat climate change and develop common approaches to managing and restoring our planet's natural resources. We look forward to continuing to work with our partners in the EU and to supporting this strong environmental agenda. I would now like to hand it over to the Office of International Relations Senior Advisor and Resident European Expert, Britta Garfield. Thanks so much, Aviva. <clears throat> and welcome everyone to this Earth Optimism deep dive into the future of a sustainable Europe. I work for the Smithsonian based out of Brussels, so I am particularly excited to host this session where we will hear about the EU's most ambitious biodiversity and climate plan to date. Earth optimism is a vision and a realization that despite big challenges, environmental progress is possible. So even in these extremely challenging times, it makes me as a European really hopeful to know that the commission has such a strong mandate and responsibility. Last year, the European people really made their voices heard in the elections and there's a lot of momentum for the environment. So I am honored to introduce Virginius Sinkevicius, who is the EU Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries. In this role, he is responsible for leading the forthcoming EU biodiversity strategy and overseeing the new Circular Economy Action Plan. Previously, he was the Minister of Economy in Lithuania and was elected to the Parliament in 2016. And I also want to mention that the Commissioner is the EU's youngest Commissioner ever to take office, so that's exciting. So without further ado, I'm now turning it over to Christian Reckberger, CEO of Dynamic Planet, to start the conversation. Thank you so much, Britta. And again, welcome, Commissioner Sengevichis. Can you tell us briefly, what is the European Green Deal? And as part of that, how the Circular Economy Action Plan work in practical terms? First of all, uh... Good morning to those uh, watching us, of course, and thank you very much for, for, for joining us on the West Coast and the East Coast of US. And of course, good afternoon to everyone who joined us here in Europe. Thank you very much for having me. To go straight to the European Green Deal, I would say that it's the new EU sustainable growth strategy. And the uh, growth word is, 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 I think, is key here. Uh, but also important to know that the growth strategy is a response to climate and, of course, environmental related challenges, which are clearly uh, the most pressing in our history. And today we are facing climate crisis and ecological crisis, which now topped up by the health crisis with the current pandemic. And what's very clear that all these crises, they respect no borders. So to overcome all those challenges, uh, uh, Europe needs a new growth strategy. And the Commission therefore presented the European Green Deal very early in its office as a major uh, flagship initiative. Uh, so I think the most uh, important points to point out that uh, we are reaching that there are no net emissions of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases uh, by 2050, climate neutral fully. Uh, the economic 
growth is decoupled from resource use. That connects very well to circular economy action plan. And, but most importantly, that no one left behind. The transition is just. So no country, member state, region, city, company, or a person. And we can be only successful if we are all in this together. So the European Green Deal provides a very clear roadmap with concrete actions. So to boost the efficient use of resources by moving, of course, and investing uh, to a clean, a circular economy. Of course, it cannot be separated from restoration and protection of biodiversity. And of course, reduction uh, levels of pollution. In January, we also tabled the proposals for the investments that are needed to ensure just and inclusive transition. And we have set a very clear objective for you to be climate neutral in 2050. So to do this, we have proposed a, a European climate law that turns the political commitment into a legal obligation and of course triggers investments to signal very clear the markets that we are serious. It's not just a strategy, it's a law. Mm. So reaching uh, this target will require action by all sectors. When we speak about a just transition, that everyone has to be on board, also uh, action will be required from all sectors of our economy. So investing in deploying environmentally friendly and clean technologies, uh, of course, supporting industry to eco-innovative, rolling out cleaner, cheaper, and healthier forms of private and public transport, decarbonizing the energy sector, ensuring buildings are more energy efficient, changing our food, of course, production and consumption, working with international partners to improve uh, global environmental standards. Most importantly, there is you know, always a debate now with the COVID-19, uh, when economies are going, not only our health systems hit, but economies as well, is it not going to slow down the Green Deal implementation? From everything, uh, what I just said, you know, from all those points, I think it can only uh, fasten uh, Green Deal implementation. Uh, when we speak about a uh, huge amount of money, a uh, record amount of money injected into, into, into economy, we, we cannot uh, backtrack uh, a, a single step. We can only go, go further and keep on investing into uh, Eco innovations into cleaner, uh, in, into clean technologies. So, of course, the EU will provide financial support and technical assistance uh, to help people, businesses, and of course regions uh, that are most affected by the move towards the green economy. And this is called the Just Transition Mechanism, and it will help to mobilize at least 100 billion over the period of just six years, from 2021 to 2027, in the most affected EU regions. So mainly those dependent, of course, on coal. And these were plans uh, we had before the pandemics. Uh, but as I just said, you know, we stick to them. And with the injection of public money into economy, we can only boost uh, faster uh, implementation. Now, uh, speaking on the circular economy, accelerating the transition to circular economy will be key element uh, of uh, job rich recovery from the crisis, building on green and of course digital solutions. The circular economy action plan adopted quite recently in March, uh, but uh, living under quarantine, it looks like a longer time passed. Uh, it was just when the Corona virus was striking, its first heavy blows in Europe, uh, remains a plan for good times and bad times and for making bad times better. So there is a key 35 actions uh, and the wealth of supporting measures foreseen in the plan, which can help you uh, come stronger out of the uh, coronavirus crisis and keep its uh, leading position in sustainable growth on a global scale while, again, leaving no one behind. Mm. So the coronavirus crisis has exposed the vulnerability of businesses to linear, just-in-time models. And as the corona crisis has been spreading, so have supply disturbances, wiping out jobs. Um, 
I see the same situation going on in, in the United States where record numbers uh, of applications. Uh, so uh, putting whole countries to uh, uh, really uh, reconsider their economic activities. So the circular economy action plans uh, plan foresees actions to make businesses more resilient and most importantly, ensure that citizens are less dependent on buying new things, on uh, consumption, and both people and innovative businesses can benefit from high quality, functional, safe products, which are efficient, most importantly, affordable. And I think what we all uh, as a consumers want, they can last longer. And that can be already pre-designed in design stage so that they can, could be reused, repair, and of course, high quality recycling. So we offer a whole uh, new range of repair services, product uh, assistance services, models, of course, digital solutions, which will bring about a better quality of life, most importantly, innovative jobs, and of course, upgraded skills. So implementing the circular economy uh, plan will mean rethinking, first of all, rethinking how the economy delivers to meet main needs of our citizens including housing, food, mobility. And uh, we want to make these systems more sustainable and inclusive as a part of the transition, which is, I think, a positive experience to the citizens. And I'm very happy that the uh, Circular Economy Action Plan um, was received by businesses and uh, by the citizens very well. Those are really exciting integrated solutions. You mentioned this perfect storm of these crises all happening at the same time. How do we really ensure that the environment stays on top of the agenda, especially in times with, like this with COVID-19, where the environment often takes a back seat? Of course, first of all, it's absolutely normal that uh, our attention, uh, government's attention across the world is currently focused on addressing COVID-19 crisis uh, in its health and economic and social dimensions. But first, of course, we have to talk about saving uh, people's lives. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this pandemic will ease. And when it does, uh, the world and, of course, Europe will be different. And we cannot expect that it will be the same as it was. And when we look at the future uh, now, uh, we cannot afford to lock ourselves into soon to be obsolete technologies or business models uh, and hasn't the next uh, crisis by doing so. Uh, so the economic recovery and the transition to a sustainable and climate neutral economy uh, go hand in hand. The restart of the economy after uh, the crisis offers the chance to fight climate change back, regenerate uh, nature and of course restore biodiversity I think we should use this opportunity and look at this as an opportunity. I think we have an opportunity to turn the tide, redesign our growth system towards the more sustainable, but most importantly, resilient, because we saw that this crisis exposed uh, many weak spots. And it's not only I'm talking about the EU, we can see in, in different countries around the globe. So therefore, the Commission remains fully committed to implementing the European Green Deal, despite some voices calling for delay. Uh, but it's a sustainable and fair growth strategy and therefore has a central uh, role to play in the recovery. And I'm glad that uh, yesterday, uh, during the video conferences of the heads of the member states, uh, Commission was given a mandate to draw a recovery plan uh, and two key pillars was digitalization and the Green Deal. So we're not uh, shifting uh, our attention anywhere. So those who think that green ambition should be put on hold because of the crisis and potential recessions coming to, uh, I think uh, completely missed the point of the Green Deal. Mm. The idea that looking after our environment is a cost that is a luxury that we can only afford in good times is completely misconception. Mm -hmm. Not only the climate and the environment cannot wait, but the underlying truth is that this unsustainable use of our resources 
is not only bad for the environment and climate, but it's also bad for our economies. And I think we must aim for uh, qualitative growth with a circular, sustainable, and highly competitive economy. Excellent. And Excellent. In these last few months during this pandemic, scientists have become central to decision making. What role do you think the scientific community will play in the post-COVID world? And how can institutions like the Smithsonian contribute to implementing the European Green Deal? Aviva mentioned some of the Smithsonian's work globally already, including in Europe. So first of all, let me thank the scientists who are working tirelessly, uh, especially on, 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 on COVID-19 on, on, on different direction. One of them, of course, is, is, is finding a vaccine. Uh, but we all seen uh, the role of sciences, uh, scientists as central, key, I would say, players, you know, uh, in the crisis. And this will continue, I think, beyond the crisis very clearly as the level of public interest in scientific word, uh, work has moved uh, back upwards. Uh, scientific research is more, much more easier accessible. And uh, I think uh, with existing uh, uh, fake news and, 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 and different, uh, let's say, communication bubbles, which sometimes people get stuck into it, uh, science is going to be that data where we're going to look at, where we, which we're going to rely. And, and of course, uh, science is the key which helps us politicians to make, um, I would say, right decisions. So mm -hmm. to fight the corona crisis, coronavirus crisis, or climate change, we need to listen to uh, scientists. In, in light of coronavirus crisis, of course, it's epidemiologists. And uh, I think we have to act globally. And we need to do the same uh, to fight other two crises, what I mentioned regarding the nature crisis or climate. And here, uh, the experts of two international plan, uh, panels of climate change and biodiversity ecosystems are the ones that we uh, need to listen very carefully. And we need all the citizens of the world to better understand what scientists tell us. That's why I really appreciate uh, also the job uh, what journalists do, uh, TVs to really simplify what the scientists are trying to tell us and get these messages to, to the citizens. Mm -hmm. So uh, to answer uh, very shortly the last part of, of your question, uh, I can give you only a very you know, easy practical example uh, from our work on biodiversity. At the beginning of March, uh, on the World Wildlife Day, the European Commission launched a call for zoos, aquariums, uh, botanical gardens, national parks, and national history, and science museums from around the world to join a United for Biodiversity coalition. Hmm. And the coalition offers the opportunity for all such institutions to join forces and boost what's most important is public awareness about the nature crisis ahead of the next crucial conference uh, in Beijing, uh, in Beijing, sorry, in Kuming, in China. And so the current crisis has slowed the formation of the coalition, uh, but we're not backing up. Uh, we need, uh, we intend to get things back on track soon and organizations like Smithsonian uh, would be key partners to make this coalition a success. And I would urge the Smithsonian to join us in this effort uh, but the Institute has also much more to offer and my research colleagues who already have uh, worked with the Smithsonian on the visit uh, of the Ocean Plastics Lab to DC uh, in 2017 do see the Institute as a very, very positive uh, partner. I think the mission here is very clear. Uh, there was a terrific job done by those young people uh, marching on the streets on Fridays not only young people, but people who were brave enough to stand up for, for climate. And now you see the effect that uh, if you ask a person on the street about the climate change, he might have a different opinion, but he will know what is the topic. I think we should achieve uh, equal results with the biodiversity. 
I love your United for Wildlife um, program that you mentioned. And I know that you've been saying that the European Union needs to lead by example and even have a global biodiversity agreement similar to the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. How will the European Union work with other countries to enable a strong outcome at the next biodiversity conference? So, first of all, of course, uh, the EU is not in the vacuum. And uh, the EU is extremely ambitious, and I'm very proud of our Green Deal. Uh, but uh, we cannot succeed alone in, addr in addressing global challenges. As I said at the beginning, you know, uh, those challenges, they respect no borders. And uh, fires, for example, in, they can be seen in California, Australia, Siberia, here in Europe. Uh, we need international collaboration more than ever. Because the environmental problems we say uh, we, we are facing, uh, they are global and they can only be solved uh, when countries work together hand in hand. So we as the EU will continue to promote and implement ambitious environmental, climate and sustainable energy policies across the world. We'll definitely capitalize on the convening powers of the United Nations, G7, G20, and make the most of the existing international uh, conventions, our bilateral uh, relationship. Uh, I think right now, protecting and restoring biodiversity is one of the key actions on which uh, the international community needs to focus. And it's also a part of the response to COVID-19 crisis. When you look around uh, and see pandemics, uh, climate change and unprecedented loss of biodiversity, you real, realize really that it's time to rethink our relations to, to nature in order to uh, prevent uh, such crisis as COVID-19 to, 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 to return. So very soon uh, we will present a new EU biodiversity strategy that will outline EU commitments for the next decade with three priorities to protect restore and to mainstream biodiversity across all policy areas. And of course, uh, we must reduce the constant pressure on our ecosystems. And we are working uh, uh, to present solid and measurable commitments to address the main causes of biodiversity loss. And same, of course, goes with the international uh, dimension, uh, which is going uh, to be very uh, clearly written in our strategy. Most importantly, I think uh, that we have to define ambition, global ambition, very clear targets, uh, which of course addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss, uh, they have to be feasible and where possible, of course, measurable and time bound so that we could look, are we progressing? And of course, extremely important, I think, is much stronger implementation uh, monitoring and review process because we had uh, great targets before global targets. I mean, uh, each targets are great uh, SDGs uh, as well, uh, but unfortunately, we failing to to implement them. Back to the EU, you have 27 member states, all sovereign nations. How do you ensure that the climate and biodiversity legislation determined on the European level is enforced at the country level? Of course, so working together with member states and making sure that uh, European legislation is evenly implemented across 27 countries is, I think, something what makes uh, European Union unique. This is not specific uh, to only environment legislation. It applies across all our policies. And EU member states... Uh, uh, participate in legislative process and you citizens elect directly the European Parliament, another key institution to legislative process. So ensuring uh, compliance is a priority task for us. And uh, again, here we have a good example of air pollution, which is still a problem in the EU, particularly in our big cities. Uh, on one hand, we support and guide our member states with things like peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, or bringing all stakeholders together to jointly elaborate. Uh, but on the other hand, when it's necessary, we also use the stick that we have by taking them to court. Although things can always be improved, uh, I think this uh, two-steps approach is extremely efficient. Great. 
During this Earth Optimism Summit with the Smithsonian, we've been discussing a variety of nature-based climate solutions, such as sustainable agriculture, forestry, and land use management, which can reduce climate emissions substantially and offers a normal additional benefit to people. How are you working with colleagues responsible for other portfolios like finance, economy, business standards to integrate nature-based climate solutions across various sectors? You had alluded to that in the beginning, but it'd be really interesting for, because we, we see a lot of silos in government. How are you actually integrating your vision across your ministries? So here is a very good question. And I think, you know, the key answer here is exactly uh, the Green Deal. Uh, this linkage of uh, various strands is one of the main points we are making with the Green Deal. Uh, reaching climate neutrality and providing sustainable growth are very closely linked to protecting and restoring nature and biodiversity, and it can't be successful if uh, everyone is not acting. So in terms of for example, finance, uh, we want to see 20 billion euros a year being unlocked for biodiversity through different sources, including EU funds, national and private funding, while at the same time ensuring all EU is proof to be biodiversity friendly. So nature-based solutions such as protecting and restoring wetlands and pitlands or sustainable managing uh, forest uh, agricultural policies a crucial part of our approach uh, to reducing harmful uh, emissions and adopting to climate change. So yes, we also see this issue that keeping nature healthy is critical for the economy, both uh, directly and indirectly. Businesses rely on our natural world uh, for inputs into production processes with almost half of the global GDP. Uh, dependent on nature and the services it provides. And I think during this crisis, uh, COVID-19 crisis, we can uh, only reassess that uh, we are very closely linked to nature. And destroying uh, nature um, with the deforestation, uh, destroying the natural resilience uh, that natural walls uh, brings only closer uh, us, human population, to pathogens. And as a result, uh, we have crisis which hardly hits our health sector. We lose our fellow citizens. And in the end of the day, when we cope with the health problems, we will have huge economic problems. So it's all interlinked and mm -hmm. can't be ignored. And this crisis is unfortunately very painful uh, example, which illustrates all of it. Mm. One last question, if I may. How do you envision Europe in 2050? And can you paint a picture for us on what that envisioned carbon neutral continent of Europe will look like? Yes, let's try. Let's 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 finish with the with the, with the positive uh, uh, note. Uh, so, of course, my hope is that in 2050, not only Europe, first of all but all of us around the globe live well within the planet's ecological limits. Our prosperity and healthy environment stem from an innovative, circular, carbon neutral economy where nothing is wasted, where natural resources are managed sustainably and where biodiversity is protected, valued, and of course restored in ways that enhance our society's resilience. And of course, our low carbon growth has long been decoupled from resource use, setting the pace for a safe and of course, sustainable uh, global society. And I think, you know, this is not a dream and we can get there uh, with the involvement and cooperation of uh, all parts of society from citizens to economic sector. But of course, EU can't do it on its own. Uh, we need everyone uh, to join us. Thank you so much for your leadership. And Britta, back to you. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you both for this excellent discussion. Uh, Commissioner, this was very inspiring. We appreciate all the insights. Um, and we're very excited to work with you and your team to ensure a science-based approach in the run-up to the Global Biodiversity Conference 
And as you mentioned, if we all with our partners around the world collaborate and leverage collective expertise and action, I think there is reason to be hopeful. So many thanks again, Commissioner, to all the viewers as well. And um, the Digital Earth Optimism Summit broadcast um, is starting now. So please feel free to tune into that as well to learn more about innovative solutions and positive actions. Um, thank you. Stay safe, everyone, and happy Earth Week. <laughs>